Welcome back to Hyperbaric Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Masha, and today I have with me Dr. Darren Ingalls. He is a personal friend of mine. He is absolutely an excellent clinician. I had Dr. Ingalls on the podcast before. We spoke about Lyme disease and MS. And today's conversation will be around long COVID, co-infections, Lyme disease, people with Lyme disease and long COVID. So we'll see where conversation is going to take us. Welcome to the show, Darren. Really excited Hello. to have you. Yeah, yeah, thank you for having me back. Always a pleasure. Yes, thank you for, for doing that. So let's dive in. Let's start with long COVID. Um, and uh, what do you find? What do you see? Do you have a yeah, I know that you have a personal story. Let's start with that. Yeah. Well, obviously, you know, I've seen so many people who've struggled with long COVID and it's really interesting. I mean, I, I don't think I've actually seen a patient with COVID now in, in several months, uh, fortunately, but, you know, we're still dealing with a lot of people who got sick sometime last year or even, you know, the years prior to that. And uh, again, you know, for myself, I, I've had COVID twice. I got COVID in January of 2021, and I felt tired for about two weeks. I got no respiratory symptoms, and I, I definitely felt it influenced uh, my MS, and I had definitely had a more difficult time walking. But after about two weeks, I felt I felt pretty good. And then uh, over a year later, in June of last year, I had traveled back to the East Coast because I was lived in Connecticut for many years and hadn't been back in, in quite some time. And my very last day there, I went to get out of bed. And I just remember I could barely stand. I could barely walk. And I'm like, boy, I haven't had this. I don't remember feeling like this since I had COVID. And of course, I had to slug my way through LaGuardia Airport and Dallas Airport and got back to California and tested myself. And I tested positive again for COVID. And really, even since then, it's been a bit of a struggle. You know, I've noticed that my mobility, my gait uh, have not been nearly as good as it was before. And again, I feel like I do a lot of the right things to you know maintain my health in terms of what I eat and sleep and movement. But, you know, it's interesting because there's been so much research that's coming out when you get COVID, what it does to neural inflammation. And we know now that it basically activates these cells in your brain called glial cells, which are part of your immune system in your brain. And that glial activation basically sets off this cascade of, of inflammation that can persist for, for many, many months, you know, hence long COVID. So, you know, post-viral sequela is not new. I mean, we've seen this with other types of viral illnesses. You know, I mean, even to a degree, you know, mono can cause that type of neural inflammation, which is why people with mono feel tired and want to sleep all day. You know, that inflammation is part of what contributes to that. So I think, you know, we've had to think about strategies that help modulate that, that inflammation in the brain. And if we can do that, you know, we find that people start to, you know, get their energy back, start and their brain starts to work better because, you know, it's the fatigue, it's the brain fog, it's the, you know, insomnia, all the other things that get impacted when the brain's not functioning well. So, you know, I've <laughs> I've had to do a lot of things on my own for my own health, and I've done a lot for my other patients. Uh, but again, anything that we can do that's going to help control that inflammation, because it seems you know, even after the virus is gone, that that switch has already been flipped. So we've got to find a way to flip that switch off to get control in the brain again. And, and unfortunately, I think you know, we've got a lot of things in our world that we can use to do that. Uh, you know, in the conventional world, I, I think they just kind of say, well, just ride it out and wait. Uh, but knowing that that could be many, many, many months. And I think now for some people, it's turning into years of, you know, some element of myalgic encephalitis that, you know, it's it's very uh, discouraging when, you know, you don't have your health back. Yeah, that's very discouraging. I uh, I experienced it myself. Very interesting. You mentioned the dates. I'm like two months away from you. The first time I got it was March 2021. Then I had another one in between, and then uh, I was hit in August 2022, and that's when I developed long COVID. So it seems like Omicron uh, gives people a better chance of getting long COVID. You also mentioned neuroinflammation. 
Uh, not everybody gets neurological symptoms, though. People have quite an array of different symptoms, right, with long COVID. For some, it affects their musculoskeletal uh, system. For others, it might be neurological. It, it could be different things. Respiratory, right? So when do you think or who is more prone of getting those neurological sequelae to COVID infection? Well, I certainly think anyone who's already got some element of underlying neurological illness, if you've already got any kind of neurodegenerative disease, if you have any kind of autoimmune disease that might be impacting your brain, you are more likely to suffer the consequences of those neurological symptoms. I think for people who have underlying respiratory issues, if you have asthma, if you've got bronchiectasis, emphysema, you're probably more likely to suffer more of the lung-related symptoms. But you know, my observation in my population is that anyone with autoimmune disease uh, or any kind of neurodegenerative disease, it, it was just like throwing gas on fire. You know, it took that situation and it just made it so much worse. And again, I, I've worked with so many people who were doing quite well with their illness. They were managing it, they were healing, they were getting better. And then they got COVID and then everything just, you know, took 10 steps backwards. So uh, it's, you know, we, we still do all the things that we know how to do to control, you know, the primary illness, but now we've had to add this other layer of like, what else do we need to do to, you know, control the long COVID symptoms? And um, I'll take it from here. So what else can we do to control long COVID? Where do you start with your patients? Well, I think, you know, with any kind of chronic illness, it's still the foundational things that we have to start with. You know, we know, particularly with COVID, that if you were overweight, if you were diabetic, if you had underlying illness, and we know that people who were not metabolically fit were more prone to having, you know, more severe consequences of COVID. So we still need to, to deal with things like, you know, making sure you're eating good, clean food. You're not eating junk food. If you're overweight, we need to work on getting your weight under control, which is really hard for someone with long COVID because they're exhausted. And the idea of movement can be overwhelming. But, you know, we need to make sure your gut is functioning well. You know, we know that up to 80% of your immune function stems from the gut. So if you're having any kind of chronic gastrointestinal problem, digestive issue, that might be influencing both, you know, your absorption of your nutrients, which your body needs to operate correctly. It may be altering your immune function. So if you can't rely on your own immune system to control the infection or control autoimmunity, you know, that's going to lead to all these secondary issues. So for me, diet and gut are always at the top of the list. Let's get that foundational stuff done first. And then we can start looking at more targeted therapies that, you know, have been shown to be helpful for long COVID. And, you know, I've always kind of followed the FLCCC's, you know, protocols on treating, you know, long COVID. And, you know, there's a very long list of things Then you know, you don't take everything. But I found that a lot of those recommendations have been helpful in my population. Could you uh, give us a little more information, especially for my listeners? What are the FLSSC protocols and what what, uh, what is included? Where can they find more information about it? Sure. So the FLCCC, and of course, I'm probably going to forget what it stands for. It's the Frontline, I think, Critical Care Consortium, or maybe that's not completely correct. But <laughs> basically, it was a group of doctors very early in COVID that came from different walks of medicine from critical care to internal medicine to family practice that started looking at you know what else can we do for covid because remember when this first came out we didn't have a clue what to do there were no guidelines there were no treatment protocols and everyone just kept sitting back and saying well we just need to wait until there's a vaccine developed but there was really no preventive measures and there were certainly no active treatments at least not for quite a while. So they started looking at, you know, old drugs primarily. And uh, over the course of, you know, several months, you know, the lot of research came out about different, you know, medications that are already on the market that, you know, seem to have some benefit against COVID. So between, you know, some nutritional supplements, some were prescription medication, you know, they started developing these protocols. And as doctors started applying it to their patients, you know, it kept a lot of people out of the hospital, it minimized people's COVID symptoms, 
it, it seemed to reduce the risk of having more severe consequences of COVID, particularly in that high risk population, which was mostly over 65 with two or more comorbid conditions. So from that, you know, once long COVID started becoming an issue, then they started shifting, you know, gears and looking at kind of the similar process of, you know, what else can we do now to help deal with these long COVID patients? So, I mean, there were things like, you know, uh, vitamin C, you know, high dose vitamin C showed to be effective, you know, against COVID. And I know, I think in, uh, I think China was the first place that published a study on using high dose vitamin C against COVID. And of course, interesting, never really got utilized here in the United States. And I think most of the world uh, for a, a, a nutrient that's relatively inexpensive, uh, you know, it's almost like, why not try? But you know, that gets in sort of the politics of medicine. But, you know, high dose vitamin C was shown to be helpful. Quercetin was shown to be helpful. Zinc was shown to be helpful. Black seed oil was shown to be helpful. There's an herb called andrographis, what actually uh, Thailand approved it as a treatment for COVID-19, which is a very potent antiviral herb. Uh, and then they start getting other medications. Of course, you know, I think ivermectin probably got some of the most scrutiny. Uh, and of course, people kept saying, oh, it's horse paste and you can't take horse paste. And I think people forget this was a human medicine before it was a vet medicine. You know, the uh, Japanese doctor that developed ivermectin won the Nobel Prize for that medication. It was on the World Health Organization's list of essential medicines. And of course, it's been around for decades. And again, when you looked at the preponderance of evidence, you know, there was a lot of evidence that it helped. And there were a handful of studies that didn't find benefit, but uh, by and large, uh, most of the research supported its use. And again, for a medication that's been around for a long time and actually has a good safety profile, uh, it, it again, it almost seemed kind of crazy that people weren't using it more, but Again, that sort of gets into the, the the politics of you know why these old repurposed medications weren't being used. Um, but ivermectin, you know, for some people worked really well. Um, other uh, medications like hydroxychloroquine, again, showed some benefit. So you know, LFLCCC as a group was basically just proactive and trying to find different approaches of dealing with COVID and long COVID. And if you go to their website, I think it's just flccc.org. Uh, they have their whole protocol for long COVID listed online. Again, some of it you can do on your own. These are over-the-counter nutritional supplements. Some of them are prescription medications, in which case you would need to work with the doctor. But they also set up a line that if you don't have a doctor near you to work with, you can reach out directly to them. And I think they're doing telemedicine with people to help give them guidance on how to manage their symptoms. Thank you. I think information is really helpful, especially for someone who doesn't have access maybe to a functional medicine practitioner integrative doctor, naturopathic doctor, you know, I'm all for naturopathic doctors. I have to promote us because uh, I think naturopathic medicine is just beautiful, but that's off the topic. Um, my, um, when, when going back to naturopathic medicine, actually, we never tre treat a positive test result or we never treat a diagnosis. We always treat a patient. Right. So, uh, all people are different, so we come up with an individualized treatment. But still, I do find that every practitioner has sort of a toolbox of the therapies that he or she likes to use uh, for any disease. And although there may be um, many different therapies that could be helpful, in our practices, we tend to use three, four, five, six, you know, main ones. So what would be your go-to therapies for post-COVID syndrome? Well, I know it's a big part of your practice. And I found a lot of my patients did quite well with hyperbaric oxygen. You know, I, of course, the downside is access for a lot of people. You know, again, if you don't have a practitioner in your area that has a chamber that you have access to and you don't have your own, of course, they're they're expensive. But, you know, it it worked really well for a lot of people. And if we could get them in the chamber, particularly early on, you know, we know that part of hyperbaric therapy is it's anti-inflammatory. So I found it was one of the great ways to control neural inflammation 
uh, when people are experiencing. And again, I've had some long COVID patients who've done hyperbaric and they've done really well with it. It's just been challenging to get people, you know, into a place that, that offers it. But for those who have been able to do it, it's been incredibly helpful. And I'm all for things that don't necessarily involve taking a pill. You know, if it's non-invasive and it's safe uh, and it's effective, you know, this is this would be something I would prefer for anybody. And, you know, beyond that, you know, again, I've, I've kind of focused on sort of that nutritional protocol that I just kind of rattled off. I've had a lot of people follow that, and that's been incredibly helpful. Um, I've also had a lot of people do, you know, other, um, I'll say more esoteric things. I mean, I, I could just, again, share my own experience. When I got COVID uh, the second time, I have a colleague out here that does Rife. And again, depending on how people feel about Rife, a lot of people think it's quackery and crazy. Uh, I can just tell you, I spent about three hours uh, with a Rife machine on me and my symptoms were 80% better by the time I got off the table. I had a tremendously positive result. And I had a, several of my patients, uh, we've got a doctor out here who does a lot of it. When they had active COVID, I would send them down to him and he would do Rife and they responded incredibly well. So again, I like therapies that don't necessarily involve taking a pill. But uh, I've also had other people do PEMF, pulsed electromagnetic frequency. Some people have done very well with that. Um, I've had people do... Um, well, I, I think, you know, between the nutritional stuff, the hyperbaric, the rife, those have probably been the top three things I found seem to help the most people. Um, and again, if people have other underlying issues, it's also still dealing with that. If you've got mold illness, you still have to help, you know, detox from the mold. If you've got Lyme disease and underlying infection, we still need to treat the underlying infection. So, I, I think if you've been struggling with long COVID and you've got some other underlying issue, uh, I wouldn't just focus on the COVID itself. I think you still need to work on all these other factors that address that underlying illness. And, and my experience with that is that it, it does seem to help the process go faster. I absolutely agree. I, I think COVID just tips the scale. That's what happens because all this stuff was already there. I wanted to go back a little bit when you mentioned hyperbaric oxygen therapy, and I know that um, a big part of your patient population are people with Lyme diagnosis. Um, and uh, I don't treat a lot of Lyme, so I'm going to uh, ask this question and correct me if I'm wrong. Some of these patients would get worse in a hyperbaric chamber. Is that correct? Or um, that's not necessarily the case? Uh, yes. However, the people that I see that tend to get worse are usually at higher pressure. Mm -hmm. So my recommendation for people with Lyme disease is not use high pressure. I want them under 1.5 atmospheres. I find if they get certainly over two, for whatever reason, that higher pressure seems to exacerbate a lot of people. But I find if they stay under two and usually, you know, 1.3 to 1.5, they usually do quite well. So again, I'm not sure what it is about the higher pressure that seems to make Lyme feel worse. But, you know, again, for the type of things that we're trying to achieve with Lyme, again, we want the anti-inflammatory effects. We want better circulation. We want to help release stem cells. All that happens at 1.09 atmospheres. So at 1.3, you're still getting plenty of pressure and oxygen to accomplish what we're trying to achieve. I also like the fact too that you know that also gives people access to soft chambers and not necessarily a hard chamber that uh, it just again opens the doors for potentially more people to have access. I agree 100%. I used when I started treating long covid patients, I would do higher pressure. I would always recommend let's do two atmospheres because it's not even you know worth it to do the uh, lower milder pressure and people were following the protocols. Why? Because a lot of other practitioners got their results at two atmospheres or 2.2, 2.4. Then I got sick myself and I didn't have access to a higher pressure chamber. So I thought, okay, I'll use the soft chamber that I have at home. At least I can get in that chamber. I was too weak to travel to a clinic and it worked. And it absolutely, you know, 
changed my perspective on it, the way I looked at it. Although I have to say that it took me on average longer than my other patients. So patients who were doing two atmospheres and higher, they got better in, in a month, a month and a half. It took me almost three months. Whether other factors influence that, we don't know. It's just a personal personal experience here. And in terms of frequency, I know everything depends, again, on accessibility, right? So we can say you should do it five times a week, but really can this person get to the clinic five times a week? But what would be a minimum number of sessions a week that you think a person should be doing um, if they do hyperbarics for a long time? Yeah, I mean, I had people kind of all over the board, again, just depending on, you know, how far they live from wherever they were going to have the treatment done. I mean, I think ideally two or three times a week would would be great. Uh, for my patients who, you know, end up getting home chambers, we have them do it five days a week, twice a day. Uh, you know, when you got it at home, that's easy to do because it's already there. But uh, I think if, you know, for people, if they can get in, you know, at least twice a week, um, I mean, I think even at once a week, it's still better than nothing. I think it still helps, but there very much is an additive effect when you do more frequent treatments. So, you know, two or three times a week would be ideal. Thank you. Perfect. Yeah, I think so too. I think it, it, it's just, you know, two, three times a week is ideal. Um, do you think that there are therapies or which therapies rather potentiate the effects of hyperbarics? Could you combine hyperbarics with other therapy to get that synergistic effect? And if so, um, what therapies would you choose? Yeah. Uh, well, I think, you know, in conjunction with the nutritional supplements, which are oral, I mean, we had some people that we did IV therapy on and, you know, I, when we do IV therapy in our clinic, I think it has value. I think the value of IV therapy were really more for my patients who we felt were having absorption issues, having digestive issues, where maybe they weren't maximizing what they were taking in. So for that subpopulation of people, I think IV therapy could be incredibly helpful. And, you know, again, using something like high dose vitamin C, which you just can't achieve orally, that that seemed to be quite helpful for a lot of people. So again, not a lot of folks necessarily have access to someone that does IV nutritional therapy, but if you do, that can be a nice adjunct therapy. And again, we had some people that did PEMF along with hyperbaric. Uh, we had some people that used ion cleanse foot baths as a way to help detoxify. So, uh, you know, any of these things can be complementary to hyperbaric. Yeah, perfect. I pretty much use, um, say, I also do red light therapy uh, to go yeah. with it I, because of the musculoskeletal problems or maybe articulations or joint pain and, and things like that. That could be very helpful, but more or less the same. Uh, and if people can't access, because for example, here in Spain, getting IV is, uh, is a quest. <laughs> Let's put it this way. <laughs> Like it really have to be an, a, a clinic or even a hospital type clinic to be able to get it. So um, taking supplements could be maybe a second best choice, right? For people. Yeah, absolutely. Like I have one more question. Relapse. Have you seen people relapse with long COVID? Let's say they got better and then uh, can they get worse again? Well, of course, it's always possible, you know, uh, I mean, just thinking off the top of my head, I can think of just a couple of people that, you know, will say they they were getting better and then they got worse again. Uh, and in those particular cases, there was an, or there was a reason why. And usually it involves some kind of stressor. You know, I, mean, I have one patient who was getting divorced, was under a tremendous amount of stress. She got a lot worse. I had another patient that was had job related issues that again, a lot of stress got a lot worse. So, you know, we know that stress often has negative effects on your immune system. And for anyone, again, who's already dealing with an immune or autoimmune issue, that can definitely add to the, the pile and make things a lot worse. So stress management is always an important part of, you know, treatment as well, because it if you're just on that kind of slow climb out of the hole, it your your body can be fragile enough that you know any big stress like that can be enough to undermine your immune system and make your symptoms worse again so we're always talking about strategies to help manage stress and whether it's movement whether it's journaling art therapy talking with a therapist you know whatever it is for you 
that helps you get out of that sympathetic overdrive and get your body to relax and not be so impacted by things that happen in life. I mean, you know, life happens and sometimes bad stuff happens. And so if we can create some sort of resilience in the brain, um, I mean, I'm a big fan of limbic system retraining. I've had a lot of patients who've gone through different programs, whether it's DNRS by Annie Hopper or the Gupta program or Saraset. I mean, there's a whole bunch out there that kind of accomplish the same goal. But I've had people, you know, particularly with Lyme that have done all these other treatments, you know, herbs and antibiotics and hyperbaric and IV therapy and ozone. And they say, boy, it wasn't until I did that limbic system retraining that I really started to feel well. But I think it does help create that resilience in the brain. So when life does happen, particularly if it's bad stuff, you know, it doesn't have that big negative impact that it might have had before. So it, it affects the ability to handle stress. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I yeah I find that's crucial. Does it mean that uh, COVID affects HPA axis and makes us more vulnerable to the effects of stress? I wonder if that's the case. So we become less resilient after having an acute COVID infection. You know, I, I think the big problem with every pandemic is that we don't really understand everything till we're many years after the fact, when everyone can go back and kind of analyze the data and look at the research. And, you know, we're still not out of it. I mean, I, I again, I haven't personally seen a patient in many months, but I, I actually I take that back. I just had a patient the other day. Uh, it's interesting. She came in to see me and she's fine. She's a young girl. And she used to be in a wheelchair and she had an NG tube in and she was very lethargic and actually hyperbaric oxygen with a combination of TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation, got her walking again, got her NG tube out. I mean, completely changed her life. And uh, but she got COVID <laughs> and you know, ended up in the ER because she just she spiked a fever. She, you know, I said I saw her several hours earlier. And she was fine and very quickly she she turned. But again, I think, you know, already having this underlying neurological issue, the COVID just kind of made all that worse again. So, you know, I, I, again, she's the first COVID patient I've seen in, in probably six months, but yeah. um, it's still out there, which is remarkable that, uh, again, you know, in the history of mankind, we've never had a virus stick around this long and continue to create issues. Now, we know that COVID is part of our world. Uh, now that it's here, I mean, it's never going to go away completely. But to still see it impact people the way it has, you know, three and a half, you know, years into this is uh, really unprecedented. I, I think we, we, we know the answer. Why is this happening <laughs> the way it is happening? But I think this is the way it is and uh, it's not going to change. I think the virus is going to stay, whether it's going to become less virulent and it's going to cause less problems eventually, and we'll learn, uh, we'll adapt, and we'll be able to coexist with it with less fatalities and hopefully with less cases of post-infectious syndrome. Whether it's going to be the case, I don't know. As you said, it will. the hindsight vision is always 2020. Now we can only guess and, you know, see whether that's going to happen or not. Um, before I let you go, uh, could you give an advice to people who were diagnosed with long COVID and post-infectious syndrome? Because a lot of people don't know what to do, where to start, what to look for. And especially that this patient population like fibromyalgia and ME have very little energy and a lot of physical and mental fatigue. So doing a lot of research sometimes is out of the question. Mm -hmm. So maybe yeah. um, like a, an instruction or or advice, what, what they can do, where they should start. Well, I mean, you can certainly, uh, I think just as a primer, start with the FLCCC website to at least have an idea about what kind of things have been shown to be helpful, what's available. But if you can get in the hands of a naturopathic doctor, functional medicine doctor, you know, have someone be your guide. I think it's very hard to be your own doctor and navigate this on your own. And there are a lot of us out there that have a lot of experience now of dealing with long COVID. You know, let someone help be the captain of your ship 
and guide you on whatever you're taking and you know how your treatment needs to change over time and of course there's so many factors like you said that play into this it is a very individual treatment even though there's a lot of things we know help kind of a lot of people at the same time but we want to find the things that work well with your body and that's in combination with what you're already taking if you're on certain medications if you got certain genetic conditions so we have to factor all these things in before we set out a plan so if you can get in the hands of someone that can be uh, your guide i think that would be tremendously helpful thank you i absolutely agree i couldn't agree more i couldn't be my own physician even though i have all the knowledge and i understand how to manage this condition in other people in myself, it's just impossible to be objective. And part of it that you don't see the, the full picture. So how can you find the right treatment? You Maybe bits and pieces, but not necessarily the big picture. So it's always a good idea to reach out who has the, to someone who has the experience. Darren, well, thank I think you. I just yeah. want to quickly, I just think one of the, the things that was maybe good of COVID is that it did open the door for a lot of practitioners working through like we're doing now video conferencing. So if you're in an area where you don't necessarily have a practitioner locally, there are a lot of practitioners out there that will consult with you online, do a telemedicine appointment. And, you know, because a lot of what we're talking about is really nutritionally based, you know, these aren't prescription medications. And again, there's so much that can be done that don't necessarily involve these other medications. So uh, if you're really struggling to find someone locally, you know, check out uh, online because said there are people like myself and a lot of other practitioners that do online consultations. That's a very good point. I'll have your details. I have Dr. Ingalls details in the podcast description. If somebody is interested in you specialize not only in long COVID, but also in Lyme disease and MS and autoimmune conditions, you have quite a, quite a big scope of um, diseases that you cover in your practice with a lot of years of experience and happy patients who got better. Thank you for taking your time to come to the podcast and share your experience. I really appreciate it. Always, always a pleasure talking to you. Guys, if uh, you think that this episode can be helpful to someone that you know, please send them a link. Um, they'll be thankful for this information to somebody who is suffering from long COVID or maybe their relative or maybe their friend is going through uh, through this situation. So this information could be helpful. And I'll see you next week.